Welcome back to the $1 million Tipping Point Podcast. Today, we have Meg Carpenter, who I'm really excited about because I don't know if you guys have taken a listen to Stephanie Bogan's episode. It was released in January of 2023. It was an amazing, wonderful episode, and she actually recommended Meg to be on this show. So anyone that Stephanie recommends, I am totally pumped about. So hello, Meg, and welcome to the show. Hi, Kiri. Thank you so much for having me. So as a reminder to our audience, we are brought to you by the Tipping Jar of Wisdom, where as a subscriber, you get access to exclusive content every Thursday straight to your inbox with actionable tasks from our guests that will help you grow your business. So head over, connect with me on Instagram at virtuallykiri or LinkedIn, Kiri Mohan, and sign up through my bio. And we'd love for you to share the podcast. So if you tag me when recommending the podcast and sharing it, I will be sure to respond and give you much appreciation and kudos. So Meg Carpenter. Meg Carpenter is a CEO and co-founder of Ficom Partners an award-winning integrated marketing firm focused on the independent wealth management space, working alongside advisors, advisory firms, and wealth management platforms at every stage of growth. FICOM exists to expand the impact of financial advice by leading human-centered business change through new school marketing. I want to point out that's capital N-E-W, school is spelled S-K-O-O-L. PR, and advisor marketing coaching, a regular blogger and spokesperson in the media on topics related to financial services, marketing, and communications, Meg is also a co-host of the New School podcast. Meg graduated from the University of Southern California with a BS in business administration with an emphasis in global management. Megan is a proud supporter of the USC Alumni Association, the USC Marshall School Business Scholarship Fund, and the American Red Cross. So again, welcome and thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so happy to be here. I, Like I said, I've listened to your podcast and I'm pumped to be a guest. So thank you. And you know what? Um, your bio is actually way longer. I'm not sure if you said there or someone else. I just want to tell everyone that Meg has a much more extensive bio that is full of creds and amazingness, but I had to cut it down because I was like, I can't read that. I can't. (laughs) So tell us a little bit. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about your your business. And I want to point out you had this great thing on your webpage that said you believe in a family first approach and it should be celebrated and not shamed. And you said you're committed to living this belief with your family, the amazing women you work with and women across the industry. So I want to know about your business and also this family first approach. Uh, Thank you so much. Well, you did a wonderful job reading that bio. Thank you for cutting it down. I always get embarrassed (laughs) when people read those bios. Um, But yeah, so I mean, we are a PR and marketing firm. We have a fairly specific focus on this independent wealth management space, which is sort of a a sub-market within the financial services broader market. Um, I've owned the business since 2012, so about 10 and a half years in business. We've always been super focused on this space. And today we essentially help our clients to grow through strategic marketing and public relations. And then we also have scalable side of our business, which we call our advisor growth marketing solutions. But ultimately, we love to be able to help our clients to really like find their voice and tell their story in a way that actually creates change and in a way that that change then ultimately drives to growth in their business. But we want to do so in a way that feels like very human and authentic and real, um, less on a lot of like what you would experience traditionally in financial services, like overly professional, top-down heavy, white male, heavy focus on jargon. So what we do at FICOM is really to help our clients, to, like I said, um, find their voice and stand out in a way that's super meaningful to them. Um, and to your point, Carrie, I mean, I have a lot of sort of um, different purposes and passions around what I do and why I do what I do. And and certainly one of them is being able to run a female owned and operated business. I am a mom first. I have three young children. I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and an 18-month-old, a boy and two girls. And um, it's really important to me to build an environment that is shame-free, judgment-free, because we all know that we have priorities, those priorities shift. And I want to be able to have and cultivate a working environment where people can feel really comfortable, safe, and secure doing what they need to do when they need to do it. Um, and in a way that they won't feel any judgment about. And so that's sort of, um, it's part of our core values. And, and I try to live up to that every day. And, and I do it for myself 
I do it for my family, but I also do it for the amazing women and men that I work alongside. And as a mom, I feel you because kids get sick all the time. And sometimes you just have to be working from home or you have to like take time off or like we were just hit with a stomach bug two weeks ago. And then last week, a cold with fevers and it was like never ending. And I was like, what if I was still working in an office? Like, I mean, this is a lot like and and of course, you, your help like nanny or whatever you have or daycare. They don't want the kid when they have a fever right. or throwing up. So you're you're it. Right. So right. I, I appreciate that you're trying to create this judgment-free, shame-free zone for women to work in. I really do. I think it's like the next step of flexibility. I think that the pandemic was so unfortunate for so many reasons, but one of the silver linings, if there were to be any, was that most companies recognized and realized that employees can be quite productive working from home. Like we all can be productive working from home if we're set up in the right way and we're supported in the right way. And so I feel like like flexibility is much more commonplace now than it was three years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a huge win. And so I think like the judgment-free zone is the next step, which is whatever it is, whether you're caring for children, you're caring for aging parents, or you're choosing to care for yourself, you should be able to do that in a way where there's no sort of side eyes, there's no eye rolling, there's no, oh, well, you know, she just left yesterday to take her kids to this and now she's doing this, which, you know, unfortunately it happens a lot. And so we are trying to just lead by example and demonstrate the power of, um, you know, having this cool work environment where we can just be free to be who we need to be when we need to be it. Yes. Yes. I totally feel that. I have actually a six and a half year old and mm. a 13 month old. So kind of oh, similar right. to two of thing. your kids. Yeah. So yeah. I'm on that same page. I totally get it. So how did you fall into this niche or niche? People pronounce it two different ways, but this niche of the financial advisement industry. Totally by accident. Totally by accident. I've worked since I was 15. Um, just working has been instilled in us, um, sort of like the discipline and power of earning your own income and, and what sort of that affords to you has been instilled in me and my two sisters um, by our parents. And so we all started working when we were 15. I remember we had to get work permits from our high school. Um, my first job was at a bakery. And anyway, so I worked, I worked for a long time and in college I worked. So I always had internships and um, actually did a study abroad program or was a fellowship program after my sophomore year in college. I went to Hong Kong for a few months and I extended my trip because I was having the time of my life. And by the time I got back, school was like just starting in session and I didn't have my internship lined up for that semester. And so I just, I knew I needed an internship, but I was behind, I was sort of like behind the process. And so I asked my sorority sisters, I was like, please help. Does anybody have a paid internship? Because it had to be paid. That was my only criteria was that I had to be paid. And so one of my sorority sisters said, actually, yeah, there's a marketing internship that's open at John Hancock Financial Network. And I said, and it's paid. And she said, yes. And so I said, <laughs> yeah. So um, I didn't ever have sort of any um, like master plan or fantasy to be involved in financial services, but it was really just, I fell into this opportunity to be a marketing intern. And I immediately sort of fell in love with financial advisors who just do such great and critical and important work with their clients. It can actually be life-changing when you think about people's relationships with money and their money stories. And oftentimes it's associated with feelings of doubt or shame or judgment or all the things and a really good financial advisor can change someone's life for the better, a family's life for the better, or a business for the better. And so when I saw sort of that impact, and then I saw that I could help to drive more impact by helping them figure out how to market, this industry historically is quite terrible from a marketing perspective. I just sort of found my passion and I leaned into it. Um, but it was it was just that sort of happen stance moment where a sorority sister got me this internship. I don't even think I had to apply. We were both desperate on both sides. <laughs> um, so that's how I got started. And I really never looked back. So I worked within that model, sort of in the John Hancock Financial Network model, starting as an intern and, you know, um, rose up the ranks until, um, gosh, I started my own company when I, was, when I was 29. So I did that for about seven or eight years. Uh, and then I decided to take a leap and start my own business. Oh, great. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we can talk a little bit about what you are offering now, because I saw you at the Advisor Marketing Bootcamp. You have the Amplify podcast, the Strategic Marketing and PR, and then the FICOM Studios. 
how does that all roll together with you in terms of time management? Well, I'm really fortunate because I have an incredible team today. So what started out is like me and a laptop, you know, back in 2012, I now have a fantastic team. I think we have 17 full-time people at Ficom plus um, another two dozen or so contractors that we work with day in and day out. So in today's day and age, like in, in where we are today at FICOM, I'm really able to focus on my unique abilities, which is I'm the visionary for the business. So I'm responsible for looking out and, and sort of projecting to the future and saying, what is this market going to need? And then bringing it back to FICOM and saying, okay, what do we need to build to be able to meet future market needs? So managing the overall vision for the business, which includes sort of that projection, but it of course includes like culture, values where the business is headed. So I focus on that. I focus a lot on business development, just making sure that um, I'm telling the story to the right people in the right places so that the business can continue to grow. Um, and then I'm sort of the internal culture carrier. So I'm super fortunate that I get to focus on those things and I have great teams to actually run the lines of business. But if it's if it's sort of helpful, like because I've learned so much along the way, it's taken me 10 years to get to a place where we have really clearly defined vision and values, a really clearly defined target market, and then very specific four lines of business to serve that target market. So it's been a long journey. I've made a ton of mistakes to get to this point, and I've learned so much. Um, but today we are able to sort of operate in a very successful and efficient way by staying focused on our target market and staying focused on our four service models even when someone comes in and we like so want to work with them, but they don't fit into one of our models, like we've developed the internal discipline to say no, um, so that we can be, you know, focused on achieving scale in each business line. And the reason that there's four is essentially like four different ways to work within the market, but the framework and philosophy is consistent across all four lines of business. There's one that's just like our scalable marketing and, or excuse me, our, our strategic marketing and PR, which is really like high touch, high impact, high value high cost. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's our advisor marketing bootcamp, which is our totally scalable virtual cohort-based coaching program. But even in those like two very different ends of the spectrum, the same frameworks apply. Um, we're just delivering them in different ways. You know, I was just thinking, this is kind of going back to like what you were talking about marketing in terms of marketing to financial advisors and the way they think about like money stories. Did you ever read the book, The um, Seven Stages of Money Maturity or something? I have not read that book. No. You know, it's I might have the title wrong and I'm almost wanting to go on my phone and look it up. But I think it's The Seven Stages of Money Maturity. And he talks about in there how in order to give good financial advice to people, and I don't know if you've experienced this with your clients, but to talk about their past and their money stories and the ideas that they hold on to because that can totally change once you get through and break that and kind of break it down and dissolve it then you'll have a lot more freedom you'll understand what they need uh, and I don't know if that applies to your marketing and PR at all but was, no it does that's I was listening exactly. to you talk about that and I was like oh that book I read <laughs> yeah no Carrie that's exactly it and so that's what financial advisors can do for their clients right it's like yeah. they can help them to um, identify their first early money stories and like work through whatever the outcomes were of those money stories so that people can understand like, what do I value? What am I looking to achieve? Um, and like really what, what do I want to do with my financial health? And so advisors do that with their clients and we do a similar thing with our clients. So when FICOM is working with the financial advisor or the advisory firm, we do the same thing, which is why do we ask them a question. And this is sort of part of our framework, but why do you do what you do? And generally speaking, when we're talking to financial advisors, they'll say, well, we want to help our clients to build and protect wealth. Okay. Well, every financial advisor <laughs> says that there is not much differentiated in that statement, but we go through the coaching process of why do you want them to build and protect wealth? Why is that important to you? And sort of drilling through a longer coaching cycle, we can often get to their early money story or something that was significant that happened in their life or an experience that they had when they were younger that actually shaped who they are today and why they're a financial advisor. Like there's almost always, unless the person's just in it for like monetary gain, there's almost always some story there that's deeply personal 
um, often sort of, you know, hidden in, in someone's subconscious that if we can pull it out, then we can help them get really clear on that first piece of our framework, which is why do you do what you do? And I think this applies to all business owners, whether you're a financial advisor that works with Viacom or you're not even in, you know, care less about financial services and you're in any other industry. I think really good marketing comes down to that first question. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because if you can get clear on that vision and values and why you're doing it, then you can get really clear on what the next step should be in your business, whether it's marketing or hiring or what your business model is, but like staying true to that why is so important. Hmm. And I've heard that so many times. I actually have that in, I think my lead magnet, like talking mm-hmm. about the why, like what, like almost everyone I've interviewed has said, like, if your why is there and your why is strong, you will make it work. You will make it happen. Yes. It's- Talk to us a about a time you took on a client that was not aligned with your niche or maybe wasn't a good fit. Oh, there's so many examples. I mean, I think one interesting part of my journey um, that was relevant to the question that you just asked, Carrie, is that I started the business with a business partner. So um, in 2012, Viacom was co-owned by myself and my former business partner. We were 50-50 owners. And from 2012 to 2018, we experienced really phenomenal growth. And sort of went from serving individual financial advisors with really small retainers to working with some of the most well-known and well-respected brands within our community with relatively large retainers. And so from the outside, I think people I heard looked at us and sort of said like, wow, like that's so impressive. You've grown so much. But underneath, you know, like on the inside, I was absolutely dying because our culture was toxic. It was not a culture that I was proud of. We didn't have well-defined service models. My former partner and I were not clear and aligned on the vision for the business. We had really high employee turnover, which meant we had really high client turnover. It was a mess. So from an external perspective, you might've looked at us and said like, oh, they've got everything. And internally, it was just a mess. It was one of those, you know, um, those feelings where you just like dread going to work. And it wasn't like, I love my former business partner. Um, I've always loved him. We've worked really well together. We've had a lot of fun. We still have a great relationship and total mutual respect and admiration for one another. Um, But as business partners, when our visions got out of alignment, things went, got really out of control. Um, and so we had to sort of figure out how to address that, which was ultimately that I, um, I bought my former business partner completely out of the business. So that's sort of a long way to get to the point of in that moment, like we, in that period of time, we brought on so many clients who were not, um, not nice right? Like they were not respectful to our team. They didn't value our expertise or our guidance. They um, didn't sort of appreciate the recommendations that we made. And so it was really hard for us to deliver any value because first of all, our team was terrified, right? It was like such a terrible working relationship. I'm thinking about one in particular where the CEO of this firm was just not nice. Like I could use stronger words. Um, just not nice, you know, called the team member on cell phones and myself on all hours of the day, super demanding, but you know, when we had high employee turnover and high client turnover, I was terrified to let that business go because it's revenue coming in the door. And so like, what a mistake, like what a mistake. And I've, I've learned that lesson like one too many times, but luckily I've learned it now. So I don't make that same mistake anymore. But like, you, sh- you know, I feel as though no one should ever feel as though they have to work in that type of toxic environment um, where you're feeling disrespected and undervalued. Like there's really not enough money in the world to work with those types of clients. And the interesting takeaway for me now that I'm sort of on the other side of that is, is when you can get rid of those toxic relationships. And it's so funny, Carrie, because like the same in business as in personal life, right? Like Mm -hmm. get rid of the toxic relationships allows you to open yourself into a space of positivity and joy and light. And there's so much good stuff to come on the other side of it that you can't necessarily see in the bad moments. But once you like clear the air and free yourself from the toxicity and the negativity, like so much more is waiting for you. There's so much more growth on the other side, but you have to have the confidence to take the leap um, and say no to revenue, which is super hard to do when you're building a business. Hold on. I have to cough. 
<coughs> Sorry. I got a cold this weekend. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you have little kids that are like germ monsters. And I forgot to fill my water. So you're talking, oh, I was like, go I gotta hold in this water. <laughs> um maybe Ross, can you edit this out? Was my editor? He knows that when I cough, I gotta edit it out. All right. Do you want to go get some water? So you have water? You know what? Yeah, hold on. Yeah, grab some water. all right sorry about that that's never happened to me before no oh, no problem i was just thinking that my six-year-old son would be like super fanboying over all of your grogu <laughs> i get a lot of comments yeah i'm a big star wars fan <laughs> i also have like a star wars podcast i do on the side for fun oh my goodness for, that's amazing. Like, no other reason all right thanks i actually have two follow-up questions on that all right ross sorry about that you can cut all that out all right. What was I? Want, I remember one of my follow-up questions. Um, that's okay. I'll, I'll jump to that one. All right. Three, two, one. So, can you tell us a little bit? You were talking about your obviously your business partnership that kind of was not aligned in vision. How was it not aligned in vision? And if possible, could you tell us how to break up amicably with your business partner? Yes. So I don't know about the second part, but I'll, I'll share my story. Um, <laughs> well, you yeah, said you still then. respect each other and you're still you have mutual admiration and stuff like that. So clearly it kind of worked out. It did. It did. Yeah. So I'll share my story for sure. So I think on the first part, um, how is it not aligned in vision? So I think as a business owner, and this is one of the greatest lessons that I've learned and it took me a while to learn it, but like, I didn't understand early on in my entrepreneurial journey, how important it was to have a very clearly defined vision. And it's not to say that your vision can't change because it should absolutely evolve, but you have to sort of have a really clear North star because you need to have a, you need to have guideposts by which you're going to make decisions. Otherwise you can end up doing like all the things at once, but not getting the returns that you need. So I think for me, it took me a while to sort of understand that I needed a clear vision. I think in the first probably five years of running this business together, my business partner and I, we didn't actually have a vision. We were having a lot of fun. We were enjoying success. We were making money. We were hiring people. We were growing. We were developing reputation, but we really didn't have much of a vision for the business. But then as you grow and your business um, evolves, you just go through different phases. And so sort of once we got through that initial, like, really incredible growth trajectory, then it was, okay, how do we sustain this? And that's when you have to get much more thoughtful as a business owner, because what got us here isn't going to get us there. And so it was sort of in that, like figuring out what's next for us from a growth perspective. My business partner is a really phenomenal PR practitioner. My background is, is more in like broader marketing, but also much more so working alongside business owners to drive growth. I love to do it through marketing, but I really can think more broadly about like business strategy and how to propel towards growth. And so for me, when I finally understood that I needed to get clear on vision, I really felt passionate about bringing together like both the marketing and the PR in a way that could drive towards business growth. And it got to the point where my business partner really felt like, you know what, I'm really good at PR. I think we should just focus on PR. So that was sort of one misalignment in vision. And then the second misalignment in vision was that my business partner, you know, we both got burnt out on the employee turnover. It's exhausting. It's sort of like soul sucking. And, and so he sort of felt like, well, let's just not have any employees. Like, let's just go back to when it was just me and you and we were having so much fun and it was more controllable. But to me, that meant I had to get rid of a bunch of really good people who had committed their professional journeys to us at FICOM. And I wasn't okay with that. And so both on like the business vision aligned with the people vision, we were misaligned. And so 
to get to your second question, the first thing that we did, because it got tense, you know, it, it was not fun. It was unpleasant. We were having more disagreements than we had ever had. And so I sort of called a timeout and said, listen, I think we need to get a coach. Like we've been having an amazing ride, but the ride broke. And so we need to figure out how we, how we can fix this ride and get back on the ride together on the same ride. So we hired a business coach, um, which was really helpful. Um, and the business coach met with each of us individually once a week, and then both of us together once a week. So we really committed, we paid, we made that investment. Um, and through the process with the, with the coach, we identified that we weren't going to be able to get back on the same ride. And so then it became a question of, okay, if we're not, if we are aligned that neither of us want to get back onto this same ride. We're not going to try to fix it. We actually had tried to fix it. We realized that that wasn't working. So this isn't going to happen for us. Then what do the next steps look like? And I have to give my business partner a lot of credit. You know, in my heart, I wanted to ask him if I could buy him out, but I never did because I didn't want to disrespect him or offend him. And he had meant so much to me and to the business and to our clients and to the industry that I, I sort of was dancing around and tiptoeing around and I gave him a lot of credit. He had a lot of courage to come to me and say, I don't think I fit in here anymore. I want out. And so that was really on him, you know, and I think he had a high level of self-awareness um, and, and bravery to come and say that. And so then once he said that it was okay, how can we work through this in the quickest and most amicable way, amicable way. Um, and we did things that a lot of like, you know, if you were working with um, an investment bank or an m &A consultant or someone who helps businesses through this, we skipped over a lot of the important strategies. For instance, we didn't have the business valued. Um, neither of us hired separate counsel. We didn't hire, you know, an M&A consultant or an investment bank to help us through the process. We just sort of said, listen, we've made this decision. We don't want to drag it out. So how can we get to this in a way that we both feel as though we won, but we also both feel as though we gave something big up. Um, and so we were able to sort of work through that process. And in hindsight, I'm sure that we both have our own feelings about that. You know, I'm sure that I feel like I overpaid. I'm sure that he feels like he was underpaid, right? But like, we knew that that was going to be it going into it. And we were able to work through it quickly. Um, and we also worked together on sort of what is the communication plan going to look like? So we worked on internal and external communication plans um, and sort of a water flow of events. Um, and we had each other's backs in the media. We have a really great brand reputation. So people, our industry trade publications wrote about it. Um, but we we stayed on message. We supported each other throughout the process. Um, and it's not to say that there weren't bruises and black guys along the way. Like there definitely were. Um, but ultimately, I think that he and I, if we look back, um, this August will be five years um, since I bought him out of the business. I think we would both say that it was absolutely the right decision and that we're both absolutely happier and more fulfilled today than we ever would have been if we had tried to keep sticking it out. It's, I mean, I've heard, I was part of a business partnership once and I have interviewed women who have, like you, who have been part of a business partnership and it can get really sticky. And it sounds like you guys really did a great job on, like you said, skipping over a lot of stuff. Like, I mean, I'm sure it, it sounded easier than some divorces too. Like, like that's really good, good for you. And I, I actually have these two women that I'm trying to get on my podcast, hopefully. I was supposed to interview them and their connection was bad, but they are business partners and they've had a successful partnership. And I really want to interview them because I've, I've heard a lot of stories of, you know, it didn't work out and we all know why and et cetera. But I also want to hear some that do work out. So TBD on that. And I think there's plenty of that work out. I do. And I think one of the things that I learned throughout the process, um, and this was just a tip that a good friend of mine in the industry gave me. Um, she's a, a consultant also to the space, but she comes at it much more from sort of the organizational management side. So um, looking at, she has eight key areas of the business that she coaches on. And she said to me, when, when my former business partner and I started like experiencing tension and I went to her to ask for her sort of feedback and guidance. And she said, you know, Meg, I've never really seen a 50, 50 business partnership work. And I thought, you know, my first response was, well, we're going to make it work. You know, like you're not going to tell me <laughs> that 50 business partnership doesn't work. But in sort of reflecting on that, and then also clients that we've worked with, and I'm, I'm part of um, entrepreneurs organization or EO for short. And I have, I work, I have the ability to sort of connect and communicate with a lot of business owners all around the globe through EO. 
um, which is a side note has been a totally transformative experience for me as a business owner. But I, I've, I've heard similar things when you're 50, 50 and it's equal, it gets to a point where nothing in life is equal. Right. And so it's sort of hard to balance the tension between that 50, 50, I own equal shares in the business. And so that would be sort of one thing that I've learned is that if I were to ever take on a business partner and actually do, I have a minority investor and then I have uh, someone on the leadership team who is very soon to be making a minority investment into the business. But I'm clear that I'm going to own the majority of the business for now um, until my plans change so that I have total control and autonomy over the vision for the business. I think it's really hard to sort of like equally split a vision. Um, I think it's difficult to equally split like a CEO role. So sure, you can split roles and responsibilities and accountabilities by having different job descriptions and titles. But when you have 50-50 ownership, you know, the entity is owned 50-50 stake, no one's in control. And it's hard to lead a business when no one is in control. And so even if it's like 51-49, it doesn't have to be significant. But I would say if you're you're you know, seeking a partner or thinking of starting a business with a partner or multiple partners, I wouldn't do 50-50 or a third, a third, a third, or a quarter, 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 quarter. Like I would really think about there needs to be one person who's going to have total control and autonomy to lead the vision for the business. And ultimately, when the buck stops with someone, it's got to stop with that person who can who can make those decisions. And I feel like I sort of have this... Um, you know, very big on like positivity and gratitude and kindness. And so that when I say that out loud, I hear myself and I'm like, Ooh, that sounds like a little bit ego filled, you know, but I think that my experience in business ownership has been that like having that clarity is very important in order to drive towards success. So that's just something that I learned in arrears, um, but that may or may not be helpful to your listeners. I think it makes sense. When I was in the business partnership, it was not equal, which maybe she did that on purpose. Like she had the majority. Majority, yeah. You talked a lot about your team and especially with the business partnership, um, wanting to keep the employees on board. Talk to me a little bit about mistakes or challenges you've had when hiring and especially during that time when you had that turnover. Right. I think that it really came back to, you know, the reason that we were experiencing the tension was the same reason that we were experiencing this experiencing a turnover because we didn't have a clear vision and we didn't have any established sort of core values. And so we were hiring specifically based on technical capabilities. Are you really great, you know, marketing technician or PR technician, or if it was for an ops role, are you a really good bookkeeper or whatever it might be? And so we were hiring based on capabilities, but we weren't hiring based on culture fit because we didn't even know what our culture was. And so I sort of view FICOM in like two, two stages. So we've been in business now for um, 10 and a half years. I bought my business partner out in 2018. So I feel like part one and then part two and part two is where I've, I've had total control over the vision. And so in part two is when we've gotten really clear on what is the vision for the business? What are our core values? And we hire first based on core values. And that's nothing new. That's like nothing shocking. We read about it in all the books, but I've experienced it firsthand. So I would say that's sort of the first learning lesson. I think the second learning lesson, and it's interesting because at this moment in time period, so we're recording this in March, 2023. If I were to rewind to March, 2022, the job market, the talent market today is so different than what it was just 12 months ago. So 12 months ago, we couldn't even get recruiters to work with us because they were like, listen, it's like tapped, can't take on any new recs. Today, we just posted for a new job and we have 310 applicants come in just on LinkedIn, not paid post, just on LinkedIn. I'm not sure I've ever seen such a dramatic swing in in my professional experience. You know, I graduated from college in 04, so I've been in the working world for full-time for almost 20 years, but beyond that, you know, if you count my part-time stuff, I've never seen that big of a a shift, but the learning lesson that I think is important to me is no matter what sort of market you're in is to try as much as possible, not to get desperate. So what you want to do is like, what I've learned is that if in those moments where I feel desperate and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's all this client work and I don't care who it is. I just have to hire somebody I've learned this now, but in in the past, I wish that I had known enough to take a step back and say, 
all right, that sounds a little bit desperate. So maybe what we should try to do instead of hiring someone immediately is let's fill some gaps with contractors to give ourselves the space to find the right person. So to hire slow. And, you know, we found in our business that when we try to hire really fast and just fill the position, it literally never works. I don't have one experience where I can say it worked and it ends up causing so much more turmoil. So sure, maybe you are able to fill a gap and you're able to make sure that the client service continuity is there, but the long-term impact of hiring the wrong people is so tough and so expensive. Um, And there's just such a great morale impact in all the things that, you know, I've, we've become much more disciplined in, you know, so first hire with values and second, do not sacrifice until you feel that you have the right fit. And if you need to fill that gap with contractors, the good news is, is there's more than enough amazingly talented contractors in the United States and, um, and abroad who can help you to fill short-term gaps. Um, and so I think like that's a temp something almost else. like temp contract yeah, work temp. while you're 1099 yeah. contract work hourly, you know, no employment agreements. Um, of course in, I'm, um, in California. So in California, there are some pretty strict rules around contractor versus employees. So, you know, we have to make sure that we're staying, um, in alignment with what the California state regulations are, but yeah, just hiring contractors to fulfill, the work. And then I would say the third thing is just sort of, we've gotten really good at predicting our human capital needs in advance to give ourselves time to fill positions. Um, and so we do that in a few ways, but I think that that's been another important lesson for us from a hiring perspective, um, getting the right people in the right seats here at Bicom has been, um, core values, staying disciplined and hiring slow, and then knowing when to hire ahead so that we're not always feeling like our hair is on fire. Oh, we have to hire yesterday. Like that's mm. a hard place to hire from. It stinks because your clients do that to you too. I don't know about you, but they've done it to me where they wish they hired, they need someone yesterday, yesterday. and not today. And just like, oh my God. <laughs> um, I know. I know. Thinking of, about growing your business for our audience, can you lay out the steps that you used in your business to grow it from six figures to seven figures? Sure. I mean, I think the first thing that was really powerful to sort of get on that like hockey stick of a growth trajectory is focusing on our brand reputation. So thinking about what were, you know, where did our thought leadership or our IP or our specific knowledge or specific areas of expertise, like how could we share that with the market in a way that drove our brand reputation? Because as we all know, the easiest way to grow is um, by having positive word of mouth. If you can get referrals, amazing. We did in the early days grow primarily through referrals. We still do actually today. But we did it because we had developed this brand reputation where people knew of FICOM. Like they knew who we were. We were present in the market. We were speaking at events. We were writing content for our website and publishing that content in the media. We were active on social media. So we were developing our brand reputation by offering free value, free knowledge, free insights to the market through mostly our digital channels. Um, and so that, that was really big for us was having a brand reputation that was rock solid. Um, another thing was, you know, being very, um, mindful about the clients that we were working with, because when you were working with really well-known and well-recognized brands that actually speaks volumes for your credibility. And so I think we did a lot to build credibility in that time. Um, and I would love to say that I felt, you know, that we had like a really clear business strategy that drove towards growth, but in those early days, we didn't, um, it was just, it was developing that brand reputation and really focusing on developing credibility that allowed us to just get a lot of inbound leads. Now our growth would have been a lot more exciting in the early days if we could have maintained client relationships, um, our, you know, our front door was just slightly bigger than our back door. Um, and so I think that our growth would have been a lot more exciting if we had taken the time to slow down, um, sort of like pull the slingshot back um, and focus on building the business in the right ways. And, and really what that is today is a focus on people and process first. Um, 
I didn't have the knowledge to do that in the beginning, but I do today. And so um, I would say in addition to the brand reputation and the credibility, um, and today we're really focused on marketing our business in a super human um, and heart-centered way um, in demonstrating value to the market and offering free resources and building a community. Um, we also have the people and process focus and discipline internally that has allowed us to maintain and accelerate growth. That's a lot of good information right there. <laughs> That's great. Did you have to change your mindset at all? to grow, it sounds like, I mean, you definitely did because you also had the business partnership you were thinking about all of that, but to step into, let's say post 2018, once the, you no longer had the business partnership, talk about a little bit, your, your mindset and the growth that you had to make as an entrepreneur to continue to grow the business. Absolutely. I had to change my mindset. Um, I was, you know, riddled with insecurity and self-doubt. I definitely suffered from imposter syndrome. I sort of looked around the room and thought, like, are they going to figure me out? You know, like, why am I here in this room with these people? And, um, and so, who am I to be here? I'm yeah, not that yeah. so I am I to do this? <laughs> exactly. So I think that I've focused on changing my mindset or I've, um, I've worked on changing my mindset in a few ways. So one is I'm a big believer in therapy. Um, so I started going to a therapist to talk through a lot of my insecurities and self-doubt. Um, I also joined Entrepreneurs Organization, um, which is this incredible global network of entrepreneurs. And I'm in the Los Angeles chapter. I think there's 150 something people, um, but I'm in this forum of eight people within my EO Los Angeles chapter. We meet once a month and it's all about peer experience sharing and um, helping to expose blind spots. And so within EO, they were, my forum was just so incredibly transformative and helping me to identify my blind spots, but also helping me to really like own my unique abilities. And one of the blind spots that they identified for me is that I'm totally blind to my own natural leadership capabilities. And so being able to watch these other successful business owners look at me and say, like, you're actually the best natural leader we've ever encountered was like so incredible for me to think maybe I'm a good leader <laughs> um, and to start believing in myself. So therapy, entrepreneurs organization. And then the third was it's the same process that we take our clients through. But um, I applied a framework, the same framework we apply with our clients, I applied and continue to apply to myself, which is why do I do what I do? Who do I do it for? And what is the change that I want to create? I do that for myself at home. I do that for myself at work. Um, I do that for the business when I'm thinking broadly about the vision for the business. But I always am asking myself in anything, why am I doing this? Who am I doing it for? And what's the change that I'm trying to create? That that's ultimately like the mindset. That's what we call the new school mindset um, that allows me to make the right decisions, to prioritize my efforts in the right way, to shift focus when I need to, and ultimately to believe in myself because I'm clear in who I am and I'm clear in my values. And so I have now that strong foundation that I can fall back on all the time. And so my mindset is in such a positive place today. And that has allowed me to find this like incredible freedom and confidence and fulfillment and contentment and all these things that I was like desperately seeking for my entire 30s. Um, you know, and now I'm in my forties and I feel like this is my decade of excellence because I've got the right mindset and I believe in myself because of that mindset. And that just sounds like, so I wrote it down. Why do I do what I do? Who am I doing it for? And what's the change I want to create brings you back to like this foundational piece of yourself for anything, like you said, but like, especially when we're talking about business, it helps you focus and say like, okay. Why am I doing what I do? Right. Who am I doing it for? That could help you with marketing. That could help you with like moving the needle in any way. And then what's the change I want to create? It's like, that's almost like inspiring because it's like, oh yes, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. It all like ties together in that nice little circle. I love it. Yeah. And if you think yeah. about like, you know, as business owners that are wanting to grow and, and reach the, the million dollar tipping point, like we all go through dark moments. Like we all go through dark times. Like, one of the best things about being an entrepreneur is that you have the high highs 
But on the flip side of that, you have the low lows. And so I've, I've found like in those dark moments, um, like for us, you know, anytime there's significant financial turmoil in the markets, our clients' revenue is immediately and directly impacted. And COVID, the beginning of COVID was tough because everything just contracted really fast. Mm-hmm. And so you get into these dark moments of like, for me, it was, okay, I don't know if I can do this. Am I going to be able to pay my employees salaries? Like what are all a million contingency plans? And so being able to come back to, okay, wait, don't go dark. Like, why are you doing this? Who are you doing it for? What's the change that you're trying to create? Like it helps to center me in those moments of chaos. It helps me to come back to calm um, and it helps me to maintain my focus. Um, and so it is, it's, of course, it's easily applied to marketing. That's what we do at Bicom for our clients. But far beyond that, like I apply it in my personal life and in everywhere I can in my business life to keep me centered on, you know, where I can create the change that I'm going to feel really good about. I really like it. I'm like looking at my whiteboard thinking of like writing it on it because it just, it does help center you. Like you said, like bring it back, bring it back to square one. Like, what is it that you're doing and why are you doing it? So how do you balance your making money and spending money in this business as you've grown? And what do you think has been your best investments and worst investments? I mean, by far, my best investments have been in people, Um, you know, making sure that we have the right people in the right seats to do the good work here at Bicom. And so We're not, you know, even though we're a small business, we're never trying to cut corners on salaries or comp. Like we always want to be paying market rate with great benefits um, so that our people feel really valued. Um, And that's, that's a, that's an investment. So people um, are a great investment. There's one in particular that I can share, but um, my, the current president of FICOM, her name is Katie Johnson. Um, and she's joined us, um, right before I had my third baby. So the summer of 2021, um, so about 18 months ago, um, and she was, she's been one of the most incredible investments that I've ever made because she and I have such complementary skill sets and she's a highly tenured, experienced executive in the industry, but I knew it was important for me to make that investment. Some of the worst investments that I've made, um, have been in actually like investing in poor counsel that I didn't vet or conduct due diligence on. So like attorneys and CPAs, you know, when I was a startup, you're trying to control costs. So you're like, whatever, I know that I need an accountant to do my business taxes, but I don't want to pay a lot. So like, I'm going to find the cheapest option or same with like, I need an operating agreement and I need a contract, but I don't want to pay an attorney a lot of money. But let me tell you, like those invest, those poor, poorly made investments have cost me so much in the long run because I've had to deal with the IRS. I've had to deal with writing operating agreements. I've had to deal with like just so much stuff where I wish I hadn't tried to cut costs. Um, I wish that I had actually thought about what do I need and who can I find to help me do this in a way that's going to be done right the first time and not need to be fixed. Um, years down the road when when the um, the outcomes are and the risks are greater. Um, and then I think we've all made like really poor investments into things like office space, you know, like at one point during the height of our um, number of employees, I and mean, we had a huge office in uh, right on top of Grand Central Station in New York. And we did not need that office space, but it was just like, it felt like we had people coming and going and clients coming in and all that stuff. And um, signing office space leases is usually not great. Now we work in WeWorks with month to month contracts because (laughs) I just find that we need to be much more flexible. So I've made a bunch of those spending mistakes as well. Um, But I would say like probably most impactful is it's all around people. That's good. What do you think? Actually, let me switch tactics. Let's try this. Can you give us some advice for when you have an unhappy client? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think um, what we try to do is first and foremost, like don't get lost in the digital world. When you're feeling tension or dissatisfaction, I would always, I say to my team, get on the phone or get on a Zoom look the person eye to eye or hear the person verbally and ask the questions. So if let's say you were my client, I would pick up the phone and I would call you and say, Hey, Carrie, I got that email from you. I, I hear 
you're frustrated. I hear that you're not satisfied. I want you, I want you to tell me more about it. I want you to tell me more about her, how you're feeling and just ask the questions. And um, I think it's, it's very easy to go into this mental spiral of I've got a, an unhappy client and I need to make them happy. I don't really know why they're unhappy, but I know that I need to make them happy. And so we start swirling because we don't actually know what we're dealing with or why we're dealing with it. And so I coach my team to sort of stop, pick up the phone, hop on a Zoom and just ask the questions so that we know what we're dealing with. And then based on what, where the client's unhappiness is coming from, then you have to make a decision um, how to solve it or if you want to solve it, because you may choose not to solve it. It could be something really simple that you can say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you told me that. We didn't know. So now that we know, here's how we can fix it. And also next time, Carrie, I encourage you to be more vocal and proactive when you're feeling dissatisfied. Like, please give us the feedback in real time. Don't sit on it. Um, we want to help you. We want to be partners with you. Um, so you can, you can deal with it in real time if you choose to, and you can offer, you know, feedback to your client around giving you heads up in real time so that there's no festering that happens. Um, or you can potentially choose to say, you know what, I don't think this client's ever going to be satisfied. And so what's the best course of action from here? Um, and if you have the ability, which I know not everyone does have the ability because sometimes we just need the revenue, but if you have the ability to say, listen, I hear your frustrations. I want to acknowledge your frustrations. It sounds like we're not going to be able carry to get to a place where your expectations are met. So I'd love to talk with you about how we can have a really great and smooth transition so that you can go out and find the best partner for your marketing and PR needs. Um, and so I think just it's about like having the verbal conversations and then taking a moment. You don't have to ever do anything in real time. Like take it back, take the information back, just listen, thank the client for sharing, say, I want to, I want to think about this. I want to take everything that you've said to me and I want to really think about it. I'm going to come back to you in a day or two. Think about it. If you have colleagues to talk to, talk to your colleagues. If you have a coach, if you have a community of peers that you can speak to, um, but sit on it and then figure out how you want to proceed. Um, I don't think anyone should be forced to have to work with clients that are always saying, you know, this isn't right or this is, you know, not what I expected or whatever. So like trying to get to it as quickly as possible and, and identify the issue, solve the issue and sort of move forward is, is always going to be the best approach. Sometimes we can do that in a really fast way. Sometimes we can't, um, but that should always be the end goal, I think. And I want to point out for our listeners two things that you said during that, which is great. One, I hear you. Like, I hear your frustrations, right? Because I think we can often get into a point of like two different um, mindsets when we hear complaints, right? From clients, especially. Is like, like you said, you can swirl around, like, how do I fix this? How do I fix this? How do I fix this? Or you can get really defensive. I'm like, well, I don't know what their problem is. Everything we did was perfect, you right. know, right? So, but being able to have that courage, I think it takes courage to get on a phone or Zoom and say, I hear you and thank you for sharing this. And then secondly, which I think was important to bring up was that you said, take some time, take a little breather from it because nothing good is going to come out of you in that mindset of either defensiveness or panic, basically, exactly. right? Right. And I know from ex from experience, because one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made, and I still regret to this day, was sending an email off from defensive mode and <laughs> being angry. And I'm sure everyone has had situations like this, but it was sure. one of my lower, lower moments where I, this client was constantly felt like they were battering me and I just lost it. But now I know, and I always take that space too. And I, I come to people saying like, okay, I hear you're frustrated. Thank you. And then I come back with a solution or lack of thereof, but you know, we talked right. about it. Right, right. Where do you see FICOM and your business going in the next five, 10 years? Do you have exit plans? What are, what are you thinking for this business? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've worked and my team, we've worked so hard to get to this place today where, where we're on this like really amazing foundation and we've got our vision clear. Our values are clear. We have an operating system that we work from that is, um, working really well for us from an efficiency and productivity perspective. And we've built the business models that we want to build. So now I'm ready to like 10 X the business, you know, I'm ready to really focus on that next phase of exponential, not incremental growth. 
Um, I'm ready to sort of feel the momentum of all of the work that we've done to get to where we are today. So I'd love to 10x the business in the next 10 years, not the next five years. Um, I don't have any exit plans. However, I do sort of fantasize about the business being so successful um, and having people on the leadership team that I could do some type of internal succession elevate the next generation of leaders, allow someone new to step into the CEO role. Um, and maybe I stay on as in sort of like a chairperson role or, or just to, con to continue ha to have some ownership stake, but to sell internally, I think would be a huge sign of success for me. Um, and primarily because I want to make sure that the people that are here in the business have opportunities to achieve whatever their dreams are professionally. And I think for some, you know, they're on the path where they want to own a business or they deserve to own a business and they deserve to sort of um, reap the rewards of what, what they're building in different ways beyond compensation. Um, so, and I think, you know, I could also see myself staying at Ficom forever, but I do think that there's part of me that would love to be able to work with other business owners, um, whether it's sort of in a venture capital way or in a coaching type of way, um, I'm starting to do that now a little bit by just offering um, my services to owners of um, businesses who are from underrepresented populations, so minorities and women, um, and I'm finding a lot of fulfillment. So I'd love to be able to sort of um, at some point in the future after we've 10x the business, have that internal succession and be able to have a, a, some more time to be able to focus on growing more businesses that I could either take an equity position in or that I could just support the business owners because they need the support. And that would bring me a ton of joy. I love it. I love it. If you could distill your advice down into one thing, what advice would you have for other women who are trying to grow their business? I mean, my advice, I've said it on this, I've said it a bunch now, but like, just get clear on your vision and values. I was going to say, I was going to be like, can I guess? Can I guess? <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, it's not like a broken record, but it's been so transformational for me. So like getting clear on your vision and values, and then I'll, I'll take it one step further and then believe in yourself enough to not sacrifice on either. So it, there will be people that will tell you never going to work. There are, there will be people who do not align with your values that might make you think that your core values are off, but like believe in yourself and don't sacrifice your vision and your values. Because if you can maintain that focus, like that's where you're going to really experience the magic. There's always going to be people that don't want to be on your ride. And like, that's okay. Just ride your own ride, focus on yourself, believe in yourself, stay true to your vision and values. And whatever success looks like for you, it will be waiting. It's harder to get to that success when you don't have that alignment and then you don't believe in that alignment. Um, so that would be my, in a nutshell, guidance. Thank you. Where can we find you? Please list your, your website, your social media handles. How can people connect with you if they're interested? Yeah, so our website is ficompartners.com. It's F-I-C-O-M-M partners.com. I'm most active on LinkedIn. So I think it's um, backslash Megan Ficom. Um, and you can find my contact information also on the website. You can fill out any of our forms and get to me directly um, or book an open consult. So I'm um, always happy to help other business owners in any way that I can. Thank you. Now, what is one philosophy, mantra, or quote that you try to run your business by? So my mom was a teacher. She was an early um, elementary school teacher, and then she sort of moved up to eventually be the director of elementary education before she retired. And in every single classroom that she ever had, and I was, we were, me and my sisters were always in her classroom. She always, always, always had this sign that said, tell me and I'll forget, teach me and I will remember, involve me and I will learn. And I've carried that with me since I was a child. It's meant so many different things to me in so many different facets of my life. I think today as a parent, um, it means a lot to me, but also as a business owner and um, having the privilege of working with so many amazing women, um, I can get easily lost in just telling someone what to do. I just, just, I need you to do this. I need you to do this, but I've I have witnessed that no one will learn that way. And it's really by involving people in the process. So bringing people along with me and then also doing that with clients, like not just doing the work because we're asked to, to do the work, but to involve them in a collaborative process. Like that's always yielded 
such greater outcomes than just being order takers or giving orders. And so um, that's something that whenever someone asks me for a quote, I just think of my mom and what she had on her chalkboard back in the day. I know. I was trying to explain to my daughter chalkboards and she was like, because like all she understands is like chalk on the cement. And I'm like, no, but like we would like learn, like, you know, you have the whiteboard. It was chalk. And she was like, chalk? That just sounds so dusty. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, and I feel like whiteboards are obsolete now too, because now everything is like on a tablet, right? Oh, I mean, she, well, she's in first grade, so they're not, they're kind of getting tablets, not much, but she's, they have a smart TV and she was talking yeah. about the smart TV and writing on the smart TV. And I was just like, oh man, I am starting to feel old. <laughs> like, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me on this interview, Meg. And if any of you are listening to this show, have found it informative and valuable, just do me one little favor and help us grow this show by finding one person who also wants to grow their business and share this show with them. Even if you have to open the podcast app on your phone, they'll thank you for it. And hopefully they'll get tons of good advice about vision and values and all that from Meg. So until next time, you can find me on LinkedIn or tag me on Instagram at Petrolee Kiri. So thank you again, Meg. Thank you, Kiri.